I follow a lot of pastor blogs and church trends, and y'all would be embarrassed at how much time I study that stuff, really. It, it would embarrass you because at the end of the day, a lot of people ask a lot of questions, like, especially before we start, well, what's the church going to look like or what's it going to be like? And, man, I have dreams and I have visions and I have a direction that we're going. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not over here just shooting the wind, but at the end of the day, I want this church to look like whatever God wants it to look like. Period. And at the end of the day, what that means is I don't have all the answers. And so we're gonna we're just gonna keep doing what we're doing. And I can't thank you guys enough that y'all are inviting people, you're sharing what's happening here, and that's why we're finding success. It's because this is a team effort. I'm gonna say that until the day that I die. And everybody thinks that this job, this part that I do, is what makes the wheels on the bus go round, and it's not. This is the easy part. Right? Real ministry is Monday through Saturday and all of the things that go into it, all the things that go into getting ready, and all of the prayer. I woke up this morning to a text from someone that just said, I'm praying for you. Man, I'm not guilt tripping everybody. Don't everybody send me a text saying they're praying for you. That's what I'm saying. Because you never know what that means because that's what creates this atmosphere is you guys being out there praying for me, me praying for you guys, praying for each other. This is just a community of believers. That's what the local church is. So I can't thank you guys enough. You have about 20 of these on your chair. Okay? I want you to take these this week. Okay? I've got thousands more of these. All right? You're going to get these every single week. And in the coming weeks, we're going to do some different things to invite people. But Easter and Christmas, right? Those are like the two big splash days of the church world. And statistically, what's crazy is I didn't do a mailer. Here's why. Your return on a mailer is about a tenth of a percent. All right? That's pretty bad return. You know what your return is on a personal invitation? It's almost 50%. And, and think about the people that you've personally invited to this church and the return rate that's come from that. It's through the roof. People want to know someone there. They want a face to actually invite them. And so you have 20 of these. This week, your, your object is to invite at least 10 neighbors and 10 co-workers. If you don't have 10 co-workers, invite more neighbors or vice versa, right? Let's touch those that are directly around us this week. And all you have to do, we've made it easy. It says you're invited. You just have to hand it to them. Like, you don't have to say anything. Like, you can, like, you can, like, you know, ring the doorbell, stick it in, and run. <laughs> and instead of a bag of dog food, they're going to get one of these. Right? Like, we've made it easy. So hand these out. You know, hand them out. I know that it's weird. I get it. Like, I grew up in church. It could be awkward. I know that. But it, all you have to do is say, hey, just wanted to invite you. And just hand them the card. Like I said, we're going to do some different things. You're going to get more of these. So if you say, like, well, I'm going to hold them this week, what's going to happen is you're going to get more of these. And we spent God's money on these. So if you throw them in the trash, you're just throwing away God's money. I want you to think about that. All right? I'm just saying, we're sending you out to invite people because this is a great opportunity for us to, to let people know that we're here. The truth is most people don't even know we exist yet. We've just been around five months, man. We're trying to get the word out. But you guys are helping. What you do on social media is just unbelievable. Keep sharing that stuff and, and doing all that. we got a women's event March 15th at 6 right over here. Uh, they got some games, prizes. We're going to feed you and, and take care of that stuff. It's just a great time to come together, get to know some of the other ladies at the church. Uh, it's simple. You don't have to do anything. Just show up. All right? We've got the rest covered. And so it'll be easy. We wrapped up our series uh, the Gospel According to David last week, and we're entering this new series called Fear Less. Not fearless, but fear less. Right? Like fear is something that grips our world. Like, I'm terrified of snakes. Okay? And when you grow up like old school Pentecostal, like sometimes people are like, hey, you have snakes at the church? You know, like, like everybody does that. It's like, but no. Let me tell you something. If a snake grows up in here, somebody brings a snake, I'm going to be yelling at Moody in the back to shoot it. And I'm not talking about just the snake. You that brought the snake shall too be shot, declareth the Lord. I hate him. I mean, my Uncle Keith, I don't know where he is, but he, he's as big of a sissy about him as I am. Like, we, we don't even want to pick up a dead snake. You know? I hate them. I'm terrified of snakes. There's two things in life that I'm 
really, really afraid of. I'm being perfectly candid. One is snakes. I'm terrified of them. They're Satan, in case you were wondering. Okay? And the second thing is failure. Like, I'm terrified of failure. I have been my whole life. We talked about some of that perfectionism stuff last week. Man, I'm scared of failing. And I don't know why. And I don't say this to be braggadocious. I admit all my faults in here, but, like, I've had... Like a reasonably successful life. Like I haven't experienced a lot of failure, so I don't even know why I'm afraid of it. But I am. Like fear is just one of these things that grips us, right? Here's the thing about fear. It doesn't exist on its own. Fear doesn't exist absent the thing that you're afraid of, right? Like a fear of snakes can't exist without a snake. Okay? A fear of spiders cannot exist without a spider. Fear is a reaction. It's a response to something else. You know, and so I was getting ready for this series, and, and today is all about, I want to I lay a foundation of one thing in life that it is okay to fear, and what it really means to fear. And then over the next few weeks, we're going we're gonna to peel back some more biblical stories, and we're, we're going to flesh those out like we tend to do. But today is just foundation. And there's one thing in life that you should fear, that it is healthy to fear, that I want you to fear. And that's God. Now look, I've already said it, but I grew up old school, right? Like fearing God meant something very different when I was a kid. Like I was terrified of God. Like I was really, like I literally was afraid of God, right? Like I thought he was like this dude up in the sky that was waiting for me to slip up and he was going to be like, bam, got him, right? <laughs> Like, I get made fun of it. I've shared this with y'all before, but, like, I'm the guy that if you put me on an airplane, you better believe I'm saying the sinner's prayer before we take off. You better believe I'm saying it every time there's turbulence, and you better believe I'm saying it before we land. Stick me on a coaster, same thing. I'm getting right. <laughs> You're all like, what about Grace? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love Grace, okay, but I'm just going to make sure. Right? I'm just going to button it up a little extra, you know what I mean? <laughs> You're going to go to hell and go for something good. I mean, I'm not going on a roller coaster ride. You know, something stupid I did before. I was afraid of God, man. I was. Like, I literally thought that that was how, like, I thought God was that fickle, right? Like, the moment that I messed up and did anything wrong, it was like a one-way ticket. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to jump all the way over to the other side that says, like, you know, one time you kind of sort of, like, maybe, I don't know, like, got right, and, like, you can live however you want. And that's all I'm saying. Okay, but I was terrified. Because I didn't really get it. I didn't really understand what it meant to fear God. Right? Fear used to work in the church. I wish it still did, because it's a lot easier than the things we have to do now to, to, to get people in the church, right? Like when I was a kid, you had to go to church, and then the preacher would preach something that scared you, so you would go to the altar. Like that was just the cycle of it. And, and, and I mean it was just perpetual and it worked. Like fear worked. Like you're going to hell, going to the altar. You know, and so you would sit in a movie, right? Going to movies was bad. If it was a long one, you were really scared, right? You're like two hours in, you're like, oh my gosh, God's going to come back. And I'm going to be sitting here watching Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> this is horrible. We had some bad theology in the, in the Pentecostal movement. They're all up, is, is the truth of it. And I'm not knocking on those guys for that. They were well intentioned and probably, you know, far more likely to make it to heaven than the average person because they, they were committed to it. But, Fearing God doesn't mean what we've always thought that it means. And so if you, if you look, and I'm about to read us a scripture about fearing God. And so in this scripture, if you go back to the Greek, okay, the, the word that is used is phobos, okay? And yes, I YouTubed how to pronounce that. All right, I'm trying to be proper. And so what that really meant was to be in awe, to show reverence to. And so it meant something totally different. It was all reverence. It was an understanding of God's greatness. Turn with me if you have a Bible real quick to Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. This is really simple. We, we don't have a ton of scripture today. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is inside. So Proverbs, for those of you that aren't entirely familiar with it, 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 it's a book all about wisdom, right? It's a book that has all of these really incredible things. If you're a business person and you're saying, like, hey, I'm new to church, where do I start reading? 
like obviously start at the Gospels, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But I'm telling you, go read Proverbs because you'll be amazed at the, the real life application of an Old Testament book of the Proverbs. Like it's incredible the wisdom and the insight that comes from that. But this scripture makes it super, super easy. And again, that term fear in this passage means awe. It means reverence. It means an understanding of God's greatness. And so the fear of the Lord, the awe of the Lord, the understanding of God's greatness is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is inside. So I want to talk to you a little bit today about wisdom. Right? Because it's something that we all want to pursue. And if we're going to live a life with less fear, if we're going to fear less, then we need a life that's full of wisdom. So that starts with the fear of God. And so wisdom and knowledge, right? They're two different things. Knowledge is like facts. Like that's what you go to school to get. Right? Wisdom comes from the real world. Wisdom is the application of your knowledge. Okay, so you've got to know some stuff. You got to understand some stuff, and then your ability to apply what you understand is what is actually wisdom. And so we're not trying to just learn a bunch of stuff, right? Like learning a bunch of stuff is great, but it doesn't lead to wisdom. And so fearing God is the beginning of wisdom. And so I really spent some time studying that and thinking about that and looking at it. And, and what it boils down to is this is the beginning of wisdom because it's an understanding of God's greatness. Right? So you're not wise yet. When you fear God, you begin to understand his greatness. So that's your knowledge. That's, that's where we have to start to build our wisdom, is having a knowledge of the understanding of God's greatness. A reverence for it. Awe. In awe of it. The greatness of God. When's the last time you really just stopped yourself and said, I'm going to stand in awe of what God's done in my life. I'm going to be reverent. I'm going to really start to understand all that he's done for me, in me, through me, in the past, what I believe is coming in my future. I'm just going to soak in an understanding of the greatness of God. That's fearing God. That's saying, man, you're bigger and better and bolder and wiser and smarter and stronger than I could ever be. It's the beginning. But how do you get knowledge? I'm, I'm one of these weird guys, like, I probably spent too much time in school, you know, so I've got a lot of knowledge. Not, it's, it's not very useful most of the time, but I, I'm just one class short of a philosophy mind. And I remember sitting in those philosophy classes, and, and there's a great philosopher that, that once said that you can have no knowledge without acknowledgement. That you cannot have knowledge without acknowledgement. Right? So if you want to begin to fear God, you have to acknowledge who He is. You have to acknowledge His greatness. You have to acknowledge who He really is in your life. Like, it's just this foundational element. I know this isn't the most exciting stuff in the world. Come back to the whole series, and it will all come together and make perfect sense, all right? This is one of these sermons. They're the hard ones, to be honest with you. But if you don't acknowledge who God really is, you can't have knowledge of Him. If you don't have knowledge of Him, you cannot be wise. Let me say it again, because that's, that's a lot of words. I know. If you do not acknowledge who God is... You cannot have knowledge of Him. If you do not have knowledge of Him, you cannot be wise. And short of wisdom, we're going to explore over the next few weeks. If you don't have godly wisdom, you will live a life of fear. If you don't, what happens is when we begin to acknowledge Him and acknowledge His greatness and acknowledge with reverence who He really is and acknowledge all that He does and acknowledge, 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 man, you just grow in Him. You cannot help it. It's a lot like a marriage. You know, whenever Chris and I got married, and we talked about how great you ladies are last week, and, and actually we were out front, and, and I'm going to brag on Angie, man. She's got like an umbrella and a kid, and the kid's covered up, and she's like, does it all gracefully. Like, if I had to do that, I would pull up and be like, somebody get the kid out of the back of the car. You know? Like, I don't know how y'all do it, but whenever you get married, what happens is, you begin to acknowledge some things about your spouse, right? You begin to acknowledge, like, 
man, look at what Kristen does at the house every day. And look at how she takes care of our kids. And, and, and look at what happens there. And what happens is intimacy grows in your relationship through acknowledgement. But so often, we're, we're afraid to acknowledge what God is doing in our lives anymore. Like, it's become cliche, and I know why, right? Like, I try not to use the term, and I probably have here, but I try not to say, you know, God told me, right? Because, I mean, that's one of those, like, things that I heard a lot growing up. And, like, I thought that people literally had, like, a phone in their office with God written on the front of it. Like, I thought if you were a pastor, that's what that meant, right? So it becomes cliche to say, God did this, right? It's like, well, I got that promotion to work, but, you know, it's like, I don't know. Like, I've been working really hard for it. Yeah, good. Who do you think gave you that ability? Right? right? I, always, I always say to people, because sometimes people will say, man, like it, it, it's great that like your, your mind works in a certain way. Like, I didn't earn that. Like, I didn't earn the ability to think clearly. I didn't earn the ability to wake up and run. I didn't earn any of that. That's, that's where it starts. If you say, I don't know how to acknowledge God in my life, how about you start with, I woke up. Like, it's literally, that song, it's your breath in my lungs, that's literal. Like, I don't, I don't know where we disconnected it in society at some point where we don't acknowledge God and what God's doing because we're, like, afraid to say that God literally did it. But I've got countless stories of what God did in my life. Countless. I will tell you, I didn't deserve to get into law school. God took care of that. Man, God has put me in position after position. Did I do something with it? Sure. But it doesn't change the fact that I stand in reverence. I fear God because I just acknowledge Him and say, man, you did all of this. The greatest moment of my fear of God has been in this church. Man, I look at all of you guys and I say, man, I don't deserve this and I'm not worthy of this and I didn't create this and I'm not capable of this and I don't have the answers to the questions and I don't know what tomorrow holds and I don't know what six years or five years or ten years holds, but I believe that if we all keep that mentality, we're just going to be amazed at what he keeps doing because we have a fear of God, because we acknowledge God, then our knowledge grows, and then we become wise. We've got to acknowledge God. I remember being in law school, and I worked for the Tulsa County DA's office for a couple of years while I was in law school, and they worked me like I was a borrowed stepchild. <laughs> I'm telling you, it was, a, it was the greatest experience of my life, but I hated every day of it. Y'all have any of those? Like where you hate every day of it, but then you look back and you're like, it made me. And it really just did. And I remember the very first time I had a chance to be in the courtroom with a big dog lawyer. And so for those of y'all, there are big dog lawyers and then there are like lawyers and then there are like, eh. It's just the truth. <laughs> Judge me if you want, but it's the truth. And I walk into this courtroom, we got a felony prelim case with this big dog lawyer for the first time. And I'm like, I'm, I'm like, oh man, this is like, I'm in awe. Like I really am. And I'm in awe, not because I thought he was that great at the time, right? I'm not very old at this time. I'm like 23 at most, maybe 22 still. And he hands me a motion as we walk in this courtroom. And I'm like, what? is this? And he says, Judge, I just served on the prosecutor a motion and uh, I don't believe the victims can identify my client if they're sitting in the galley with everyone else. And I have a case that says that I get to put my client back there with everyone else and they have to identify. Guys, my pants are like that around my ankles. I have no clue what this guy's talking about. Right? And he wins. And I'm like, how did this happen? Right? And after that, I had to acknowledge how great this guy was and what he did. And so I started, every time he was on a docket, I went to court. And I would just sit. And I would just watch. And I would just learn. All that I could learn. But I had to first acknowledge that he was great before I could learn from him. We've got to acknowledge 
who God is if we want to really grow and become wise. That's a healthy fear of the Lord. You know, I think the question often becomes is, what does the fear of God actually look like in my life, right? Like, I, like, I don't know. Like, you want me to acknowledge, I get that. But what does it mean beyond that? Psalm 33 and 8. This is really simple again. It says, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. Let me, let me read it again. Let all the earth fear the Lord. So let all of the earth be in awe of the Lord. Let all the earth reverence. Let all the earth begin to understand the greatness of God. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. I'm going to begin to close if I can get the praise team back up. I love this because it says that we're going to stand in awe. That's fearing the Lord. Fearing the Lord is standing in awe. I love that concept because when you begin to really think about it, Standing is a place of rest. Now some of you are saying, oh, that's sitting. Right, but this is my All right? Standing is a place of rest. Right? So you say, how do I fear God? How do I acknowledge God? How do I really begin to understand Him? It's not hard. You stand. You gain a position of rest in God. I love that because, man, we get just tired in life. And when we're tired in life, what happens is we flip where we should spend our time. We should spend it with God, but what we do is we chase everything else that the world has us distracted by, right? The, the devil loves to distract us in today's society. We have so many things that we try to do, that we try to get to, that we try to be responsible for. I used to look forward to the day that my kids would play ball. I dread it now. <laughs> it's exhausting, Mark. I, I, I don't even know how y'all have time to post it on Facebook. But let's do it. I'm telling you, though, what happened is the devil has used our desire to be involved in everything against us. I'm not dogging anybody whose kids play ball. Don't get me wrong. I love ball as much as the next guy, okay? But what happens is we become so distracted. So consumed with every single thing that we have to get to that we fail to just rest in His presence. We fail to just stand in awe and say, God, I acknowledge you. There will always be a distraction. And the distraction will always make you tired. Where are you going to rest? Are you going to rest in His presence? Are you going to rest in a healthy fear of God, in awe, in reverence, in an understanding of who He truly is? Or are you going to rest in this world? I'll tell you guys, I've never been more tired in my whole life. Ever. I went to law school and worked 30, 35 hours a week. It doesn't even compare to the fatigue that I feel. But I have never been more energized and excited because, man, I just stand in awe of what He's doing all around me. And I say, God, I'm going to fear You. God, I'm going to acknowledge You. God, I'm going to stand in awe and just rest in the fact that You have it all under control. That tomorrow... It's going to work out because your hand is on it. That the difficulties that I'm facing, that the struggles, that the, the fatigue, that all of that becomes erased in your presence. Man, that's why we worship as long as we worship here. I can worship all day long. We used to do that when I was a kid. We're way too cool for it now. I don't know how. We would worship Preacher would preach for like two hours. You come back, you worship more, man. Now we're like, I don't want to hold my hands up that long. They get tired. It's true, right? At some
some point we became too cool to acknowledge God, and at some point we became too cool to rest in His presence. Yeah. Are we going to fear God? Man, it's a healthy thing. You don't have to be afraid of Him like I was when I was a kid. You just have to stand in awe of Him and acknowledge who He is. And that's the beginning of finding wisdom, and that is where you will find your rest, is in acknowledging who He really is and beginning to understand. We can bow our heads and close our eyes. If there's anyone in this room that would just say, Jacob, I don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. I don't stand in awe of Him. I don't rest with Him. I'm not wise with Him because I don't know Him yet, but, but I want to accept Him as my Savior. We're not going to embarrass you. If you just slip up your hand, we just want to say a prayer for you. anybody in this room that would just say, man, I, I, I need to start fearing God. I need to start standing in awe. I need to start understanding His greatness and who He really is. You would just slip up your hand and say, I need rest. I need to rest in His presence. I'm going to pray with us. Then we're just going to sing one more song and let's just stand in awe of Him. Let's just acknowledge Him who He is. Dear Heavenly Father, we can't thank You enough for all that You've done, all that You've given, all that You work out in our lives. Your hand is upon us, God, and we just stand in awe of You. We rest in Your presence. We acknowledge Your greatness. We acknowledge that death has no sting because You stole the keys to death. We thank you that you give us new life. We thank you that you give us hope. We just enter into your presence, God, and lift you up. God, we fear you in all things. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's just stand up and worship you.
Remember to take these cards. Invite those 20 people to Easter next week. I'm telling you, if you'll start this week by fearing Him, by standing in awe of Him and acknowledging Him, and beginning to understand all He's done in your life, there's no greater way to invite someone than to tell them what God's done for you. Your story is the realest one you'll ever have. Amen. Y'all have a great week. Invite somebody to be back with you next week.